Okay, good morning everyone uh, and welcome to the ninth meeting of 2019 of the Social Security Committee. Can I remind everyone present to turn mobile phones and other devices to silent or switch them off so they don't disrupt the meeting? We've got one apology this morning. Keith Browdy, MSP, unfortunately can't be with us, but other colleagues should join us in the course of the meeting. Uh, and we move to agenda item one, which is a decision to take an item in private. And the committee is asked to agree to take item four, consideration of evidence here during this meeting in private. Do we have agreement for that from members? Thank you. Uh, we move to agenda item two, social security support for housing. This is the second evidence session of the committee's inquiry into social security support for housing. The session this week is comprised of two panels and will focus largely on organisations supporting tenants and those seeking accommodation. Can I therefore uh, welcome this morning uh, panel one and can I welcome Aoife Deary, Campaigns and Policy Officer, Shelter Scotland, Mike Daly, Solicitor, Advocate and Principal Solicitor, Govan Law Centre and Ailey McIver, Volunteer, Living Rent. Thank you the three of you this morning for joining us and helping us with our inquiry and with your permission we'll move straight to questions if that's all right. First question from Alison Johnson, MSP. Thank you convener and, and good morning. Um, I'd like to discuss the impact of changes to the local housing allowance in the first instance, if I may. Um, changes to local housing allowance means that it provides much less support for housing costs than it used to. And I appreciate there are differences across the country, but in areas where rents are particularly high, such as by my own region of Flothian, um, that can be a real issue. You know, for someone seeking to rent a one-bedroom property in, in Lothian, you know, it can be the case that less of five percent, less than five percent in the market is accessible to them. Um, I appreciate that that's a particularly dire situation, which doesn't apply across the country. But could you, um, uh, you know, just give us your views on the problems that that would cause to someone who is looking to rent using housing cost payments? I'm up, I'm, I should point to <coughs> that. I don't always know people want to speak, so. Do, Please do telegraph it, make it clear when you want in, Mr Daly. Yes, thank you, Convener. Uh, I mean, ultimately, the, the local housing allowance is completely inequitable. There's no doubt about it. Even when it was introduced in 2008 and it was set at the 50 percentile, um, that caused problems. Mm -hmm. And, of course, now it's set at the 30th percentile, and the reality is it's been frozen and it's not been linked to the local market rents. So... Um, it's plain that for, for, for people, for example, in, in your constituency, um, you're looking at the discrepancy between the local housing allowance and what people will have to pay on average in terms of the rent. Just between the local housing allowance as it was frozen is about £22 a week. So immediately you start to see that the reality for, for people in the private rented sector that are receiving, uh, whether it's uh, universal credit housing uh, costs or indeed legacy housing benefit, is that, is that ultimately they are pushed into poverty because they are not treated, it's a discriminatory system where they're treated differently from tenants in the social rented sector and they're having to find that extra amount of money in order to pay the rent against the reality, which is if you look at the Lothians and you look at, for example, Greater Glasgow, the rents in the private rented sector in, in those areas have more than almost doubled uh, in terms of the rate of the consumer price index. Uh, since um, uh, 2008. So the reality is that, that rents are overheated in the private rented sector and at the same time, because of the hostile environment that's been created by the UK government, it's got tougher and tougher and tougher for tenants. Okay, thank you. Aoife, do you want to...? Yes, I would just um, reflect everything that Mr Jelly has said. Um, in our experience, and we do, um, most of our experience around this has come from the Lothians area, so we do know exactly what you're speaking about. What we're really seeing is an affordability gap being created, a lot of families particularly, um, because it is families who are increasingly moving into the private rented sector as the private rented sector's size has grown. We're seeing that they are particularly struggling to to sustain their tenancies, but also for younger people to access tenancies in the PRS just because of the limited um, help that LHJ can now give them. Okay, thank okay. you. Really? Just to echo that, yes, um, as a union we represent any tenant, but in Edinburgh in particular a lot of our members are under 35, which means that they get the reduced shared room rate as well, which is even more of a squeeze um, than the reduced rate itself. And there is a massive discrepancy in what people um, actually get in terms of support and then what they have to 
pay for their rent. So just to give an example, um, we had a young person who was in her early 30s. She was in full-time work, but in receipt of um, Social Security support. And it actually took her, um, when she had to leave a tenancy because she couldn't afford the rent increase, um, she was looking for another house, she had to it took her five months to find another place that she could actually afford with both her housing costs paid and topping up with her own um, her own wages. So, you know, that's five months of being homeless mm -hmm. um, because she couldn't find a place to live. And as somebody who was um, unfortunately struggling with mental health problems and things as well, it was incredibly difficult for her. So the situation is bleak, um, particularly in areas like Edinburgh. That case is from Edinburgh itself. Um, but... Yeah, that is shocking. I mean, I suppose when you get to the the stage where only 5% of the market is accessible to you, it is going to take people longer and longer to find somewhere. I mean, where do you think we're headed with this? I don't think it's sustainable. I mean, I, and, I, and I've said this before in, in other committees of the Scottish Parliament, that ultimately what we need to do, I mean, I appreciate, and certainly Government Law Centre has some views in terms of what the Scottish Parliament can do with the powers uh, under the Scotland Act 2016, but at the same time accepting that the Scottish Government can't mitigate everything that comes from Westminster, so we accept that. But ultimately, if we look at the market in, in cent the central belt of Scotland, um, ultimately it's been overheating and overheating and overheating. I mean, the idea that you've got double the rate of inflation, rent increases can't be sustainable. I mean, in, in our experience, often we think of the private rental sector that our clients see in Glasgow as being double the rent of the social rental sector and half the quality. And, it's, and if you think about how much of that is funded from the public purse, yeah. we need to do something about it. So one of the things I think the Government Law Centre uh, want to do, and I should declare that, that we are uh, assisting the Deputy Convener with, with our proposed bill, um, we need to look at systemic, wider solutions. So I think the Scottish Parliament could do more in terms of Social Security, and we would call on the Scottish Government to return the local housing uh, allowance to the 50 uh, percentile. Now, appreciating that has to come out of the Scottish Government budget, which is not easy, but I think that's fair. We would also say, let's get rid of discrimination against people that are under 35. That's completely wrong. And at the same time, let's beef up the good intentions from the Scottish Government when it introduced the private uh, um, housing tenancy Scotland Act 2016. Nobody's ever used a rent pressure zone. And ultimately, the powers that are in that Act, as I say, well-intentioned as they are, now, in where we are in 2019, I think have to be beef, beef, beefed up. So I think we need to beef up rent control. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Just before others come in, I really appreciate your comments on that. And I had to say this last week as well, because we have to keep reminding ourselves we're a social security committee, we're yeah. not the local government committee. It's, it's really tempting as it is to get into all of that. So we are mm -hmm. looking for uh, recommendations, as Mr Daly has made in terms of how social security could be changed, <coughs> either at Scotland, Scottish level, a local authority level, or at a UK level, we're able to make recommendations in all three tiers of government. And that was a, a, a helpful if challenge and very specific yeah. proposal from Mr Daly. So uh, it just, it's in that spirit, if there's any suggested changes <coughs> within how social security works, would be very helpful. Uh, I don't know if Ailey or Aoife want to come in on that. Uh, Aoife then will take Ailey, yeah. Yes, just to reflect that, um, in terms of social security solutions, um, taking away the shared room rate would be a really helpful um, measure to take. Um, really restoring LHA to where it reflects market rents as well, because as Mr Daly pointed out, over the years, um, effectively the link between LHA and market rates has been broken. Um, one doesn't reflect the other. So actually revising LHA so that LHA does give access to the market would be really helpful too. Um, and. Okay, no, that, that's helpful. Um, Ailey McIver? Yeah, um, I would just echo what Aoife and Mike have said. Um, definitely, we need to get rid of this discrimination against young people that they can only live in a, in a shared um, house rate. Many times that is not going to be appropriate even for that person and it is, is flat out discrimination. So we would say yes, that absolutely has to go. Um, increased support um, through DHPs um, for would be and would be great as well. Obviously, we know that's a, a finite pot of money, and there's a limit to what that can do. Um, but if there was, and we know that uh, the whole of that has to go through um, full uh, bedroom tax mitigation, which we obviously support. But if there was more money available to support um, discrepancies between actual rents and the amount that LHA covers, then that would be beneficial. But I think it's really important to remember the context in this that in the private rented sector. Um, you know, poverty has increased by 75% in that sector. 
that marginalised groups, people who are already um, lack power in our society, are overrepresented in the private rented sector. So young people, black and, math, um, <coughs> black and ethnic minorities, migrants and the working class and women as well. So it's really, really important that we think about this question socially and that we do as much as we can to ensure that poverty is not exacerbated. OK, thank, thank you, Alison. Um, do you want to go on a supplementary on that just now, Pauline? Yes, um, thank you very much. Um, you, you sort of probably answered my question, but in the context that some people believe, and I just emphasise some people believe, uh, that the new secretary, Amber Rudd, is open to review the universal credit system. So let's just see um, if there was that possibility that she was open-minded. Um, that, that, would that be your answer to the priority? Or I suppose, what's the evidence that the, the society is impacted on uh, uh, the, the registry of local housing allowance? Mm -hmm. Ellie, do you want to? Yeah, um, I guess for our members, our tenants, people re you know, repeatedly telling us that in order to make up the shortfall of their rent, as obviously a priority payment, then they're needing to reshuffle what are already very tight budgets. You know, even people who are in full-time work, it's extremely difficult to cover all expenses. So they're maybe foregoing um, other things like food or heating or anything like that. So cutting back on things just so they can make rent payments. Um, Is it leading to homelessness? Do you have evidence of that? I see Mr Daly, a nodding head doesn't get picked up on the official report. Do you want to...? <laughs> uh, Governor Law Centre certainly has evidence, and I, and I would echo what uh, Ailey has uh, said. Uh, I mean, the reality is that if, if you've got a shortfall between what you get uh, in terms of housing costs with your actual rent, you, you know, and you, want to, and you can't get into the social rented sector, and there's lots of reasons for that we can go into if the committee wants. But So the reality is, if you want to actually have a roof over your head, you have, you have to use whatever other income you have. I think, I think, Deputy Convener, we also have to see this in the context of the reality of people having zero-hour contracts and not having security in work. Yeah. So people are using whatever they can to make the shortfall. They're getting into rent arrears. And ultimately, at Govern Law Centre, I mean, we set up a specialist private mm -hmm. rented project for the whole of Glasgow because we were seeing people mm -hmm. coming more and more to advice agencies across the city because of the private rented sector. That is where Ailey said is where poverty has increased exponentially other than any other homeowners or social rented sector. So the evidence is overwhelming. The Joseph Rentree Foundation did a study um, uh, on this and that includes Scotland. So there's no doubt that there's empirical evidence that that poverty has been created. And in terms of social security solutions, and Government Law Centre has been running a campaign that universal credit should be devolved in its entirety to this parliament. Uh, we are supported by Unison. Uh, uh, the STUC supports some of our, uh, some of our uh, uh, recommendations. Because universal credit is the thing that amplifies and exacerbates the mess that we're in and is leading to more people basically going to food banks, and more people not being able to pay the rent, being evicted, and ending up homelessness. Okay, uh, Eva, do you want to add anything to um, that? Yeah, well, I would yeah. obviously echo everything that's just been said, but um, where we're seeing that where people are becoming homeless um, from the private renter sector, it's mainly as a result of um, the benefit cap, um, which kind of compounds the problems we've already talked about. So we, um, in our submission to the Work and Pensions Committee recently, um, we uh, compiled our evidence, looked at our um, case evidence, and it, we found that we had worked with about 80 families over the course of 18 months who'd been affected by the benefit cap, many of whom had become homeless as a result. Um, so we know that they're really struggling to afford rent in, in the private rented sector. And this, as they become homeless, obviously puts more pressure on an already pressurised homeless system too, which creates what we think is a bit of an untenable um, situation. Um, so if we're talking about social security solutions, um, I think we also need to consider the removal of the benefit cap as a priority as well. OK. Um, can I just ask then, because there was a couple of specific, well, there are several specific proposals there. Now, I'm, I'm going to resist the temptation of saying whether the the UK government should do this, or whether the Scottish government, by ways of mitigation, should do this. Um, but um, in terms of the 50 percentile suggestion that was made, in terms of the, the shared room rate, has any estimation been made of how much that might cost, whether across Scotland or maybe 
and a local authority where a bit of work's been done in relation to that, that would be helpful to know. But I think more importantly, what would be helpful to know is how many individuals or families there might be out there in the communities that we all represent that might be more likely to find a, pri a quality private rented sector housing solution as opposed to, and I'll come back to this for the follow-up question, a hugely expensive solution, imperfect and flawed <coughs> solution of long-term temporary furnished accommodation, for example. So there's a lot of money tied up in the system. So I'd be keen to know how many individuals or families that we could project would benefit from the 50th percentile and the shared room rate going to allow people to actually move into good quality uh, housing solutions. I mean, that, 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 that would require a piece of work to be done, but, but I think, um, a, a convener, the, the data is there um, across the different parts of Scotland. We have the numbers in terms of who are receiving housing uh, payments, whether through uh, universal credit or, or housing benefits. So that, that, that could be done as a calculation um, um, I'm not going to volunteer. I'm going to do it necessarily myself because right. I need to go back to my office and find out do we have the, the resources to, to do that. But I mean, certainly, uh, I think uh, amongst um, ourselves and shelter, um, that, that is something that could be done. I think the very short answer is, although we can't give you a specific figure right now, <clears throat> um, certainly it would be a significant number of people that would be that would gain from that recommendation. Coming back to Alison Johnson's point, talking about, you know, there's only 5% of the market open to people uh, private renting in the Lothians, for example. Well, if it went up to the 50th percentile, that would open up the market to more people. So, so that would be a good thing. At the same time, I'm conscious that the downside of this is that would that then fuel and overheat the market and of course that that's why and i won't go into the other solutions that are out with the remit the social security committee convener but i yeah. think that's why we need to have a multifaceted approach yes. to this and i accept that but i do think social security is at the heart of it that, that's helpful if i really want to add anything to that or any additional comments okay the, the reason for asking i'm going to just mm. come back with it a little bit more but the reason for asking <coughs> is that it's not that i anticipate shelter or the government law center will have done that work but i would anticipate that if we're looking at a social security solution we have to do some projections in relation to that mm. and one of the hugely expensive and uh, ineffective ways of supporting uh, people in tenancies is temporary furnished accommodation mm. without any permanency and security. Um, do, you, do any of you have any comments to make about the expense of that mm. for those that are using it or for the public purse um, who are funding what is sometimes <coughs> pretty poor accommodation for constituents we represent and how that money could be, be better spent? Some numbers around that would be really helpful as well, whether you have them here today or could provide them. Aoife, was that something you, you could comment on? Yes, definitely. Um, I don't have the exact numbers to hand, but we'll provide them to the committee at a later date. But we are aware that um, temporary accommodation um, that you're referring to in some local authorities is extremely expensive, sometimes often triple the price of what it would be as a mainstream um, flat. And that's really um, sort of a confusing and almost ridiculous situation to be in, that when a person becomes homeless and they're living in temporary accommodation, that they're paying way beyond the odds for what you rightly said is often quite poor quality accommodation um, as well and it would make absolute financial sense for them to be moving in to the private rental sector in some cases because the private rental sector works for some people very well and works for other people not as well but I think it would be a really valuable use of the committee's time to look into that but as I say I don't have the exact figures to hand but we'll provide them. Before I bring others in in relation to that Aoife I'm just wondering if you'd be able to kind of maybe flesh out to the committee what elements of the social security system if, if the person is not working what elements of the social security system would pick up the the, the costs of that because how we take those costs back out of the system and put them back in a way that supports people to get the housing solutions that we'd all want to see. Mm -hmm. Well, if I've understood you correctly, um, if a person is obviously not working and they go into temporary accommodation, that cost is covered by a housing benefit. Um, and I don't, it's not covered by universal credit housing costs yet. It's still a housing benefit. So it is a huge cost to the public purse. If the person is working, they are... Um, 
eligible to pay this cost themselves and we've worked with many families who are, have accrued massive arrears as a result because there's absolutely no way, as um, Mr Daly put it, a lot of people um, are on insecure work, are in insecure work and on zero hours contracts and really struggle to meet this often exorbitant cost of temporary accommodation. So it's either housing benefit that pays for it or the person is liable themselves, but either way, it's not really a sustainable um, way of working the, the temporary accommodation, if you understand what I mean. Okay, and, 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 uh, yes, that makes sense. And anecdotal information from any politician should all be taken with a little pinch of salt, but anecdotally, from my constituency casework, I know families who are homeless and stay in pretty overcrowded situations with families or friends or sofa surfers because quite frankly they're in work and they just can't afford the the the, the eye-watering costs of temporary furnished accommodation and the cost to put their furniture and storage with the local authority contractor that does that so they'll they'll, they'll get they'll go they'll go to some kind of store somewhere they'll put story their own furniture and storage at the cheapest possible cost and they'll sleep at the sofa and on camp beds in family and friends houses um and they're maybe under the radar. So that's anecdotally from me, but it's not anecdotal if um, our witnesses here today think that's a, an increasingly common um, event or occurrence. It, it, Mr certainly, Daly? It, it certainly is convenient. I mean, I, I think there's also a sex discrimination uh, aspect to this because 80% of uh, single parents who are homeless and, and who are in temporary accommodation are women. I've got clients who are women with kids who can actually, who want to get back to work and have went back to work part-time and full-time and they can't afford to stay in their temporary accommodation. So one client, for example, and I'm in the process of raising judicial review proceedings against a local authority in this case, who's been sued for £14,000 of back rent and they've tried to make you know, good of their life, they've tried to get into work, but, but they, they're, they're stuck in this four years in, te in a temporary accommodation flat as a homeless person. So there's a gender uh, issue to this, but I, I would also say there's an even equally uh, massive scandal, um, and I don't know if the, the committee members have saw the Herald on Sunday uh, just there, uh, but we've been working with the Herald on Sunday at Govan Law Centre and we've been taking them around what can only be described as homeless hotels uh, in the city of Glasgow who are charging over £300 a week to live in a grotty room and you've got, we've got clients that have lived in those, uh, those, those rooms, those temporary accommodations for over 10 years. It's, it's an absolute scandal because that money is public money. Yeah. And so what we did was, and, and don't get me wrong, the Scottish Parliament's done some wonderful things in terms of homelessness, and I won't stray off into this, but, but what it's done is lots and lots of really innovative things, but we're then faced with the reality of, of the austerity agenda from the UK government, yeah. and then we discover that you know, street homelessness rises. And, and, and so we, we've got, you know, we got rid of the hostels in Scotland, uh, rightly so, and what we've done is we've actually recreated the hostels under the guise of hotels that are privately owned, ripping people off, ripping the public purse off, and people are getting misery out of it. OK. Um, Ailey McIver, I'm conscious you've not had the opportunity to respond to this line of questioning. And if I'll take you back in a second, Ailey, do you want to add anything? Yeah, um, just to kind of echo a few things that have been said, I guess. Um, as I said before, the tenants that we've supported tend to be um, younger people, they tend to be single, and also... Um, a lot of them are in work and we have not supported that many who have been through the homeless system but those that have a number of them have told us that they've ended up sofa surfing or you know staying in whatever types of precarious accommodation with friends or family simply because of the question of affordability you know they're in work so they're not eligible for um, to have those costs paid in temporary accommodation so it has been Okay. Like, you know, their only option to do that. Okay, thank you. And Aoife Deary? Just really briefly, um, I just wanted to point out there are also other hidden costs as well, whether the person accesses temporary accommodation or not, um, and especially if they access temporary accommodation, which we know, um, especially for families, they're put far out, often far out with their support networks, outside the children's education networks, so they're incurring extra costs around transport particularly, and you've touched upon sort of the quality of some accommodation types that are provided and these accommodations often, often lack many facilities and we've worked with many families who haven't had the ability um, to cook fresh meals for example, um, aren't able to store food and are having to rely on very expensive sort of takeaway food um, which isn't um, sustainable for them. Okay, thank you. And I, just, I checked to my colleagues, Mr Allen, I'll take you in shortly, but uh, Michelle Ballant has been very patient for a couple of supplementaries on this theme, Michelle. Thank you, yes, you've covered some of it. Can I ask you 
when we're talking about the, this sort of temporary accommodation, particularly these kind of hotels as you describe them, who is actually commissioning them? Who is actually, you know, driving it, if you like, and controlling it? Because somebody somewhere is making the decision to, to use this facility for people. Well, as local authorities, and I mean, I, I, and I could I could talk obviously from from the Glasgow experience because mm -hmm. that's that's although we, we do various things all across Scotland, that is our uh, one of our core areas. Um, the part of the problem with Glasgow's situation is a stock transfer council. Mm -hmm. You know, so from two thousand and three, all of its eighty thousand you know houses went into the rented uh, the social rented in terms of housing associations. So the council then had to get back some accommodation. Mm -hmm. So it, actually Glasgow City Council then became a landlord again and it has got some properties which it basically uses for families. So um, so if, you, if you're a single person mm -hmm. um, you won't get into one of these furnished temporary lets. So basically what does Glasgow City Council have? Well it doesn't have anything. Um, so ultimately it uses the private sector which is these hotels. Oops. And in terms of these hotels the big problem with them is they're not actually really regulated by anybody because they don't provide support, so they're not regulated by the Care Commission. Um, they are, I think it's a lacuna in the law. I think they've slipped through a gap and mm -hmm. are basically milking the public purse. So the, so the housing unit of the local authority is doing the deal with these hotels. I mean, as a, as a commissioner of something like that and, and somebody is paying it, surely mm. they should be, be doing something around conditions rent in terms of the offer or agreement that they're making with them? Are, are, they, just, are they just not bothering? Or is it just that the whole of the market has ganged up on them? You know, what, what's actually going on there? Because it seems to me that somebody somewhere is not actually gripping it. Oh, I mean, I, 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 wouldn't say, I wouldn't say Glasgow City Council is not bothering because, I mean, obviously um, you've got professional uh, you know, council officers that want to do the very best and help people. But the reality is when you've, got, when you've got an increase in demand, and that's what's happened in Scotland, we have had an increase in demand. You know, people, if you think about how we reduced homelessness, and we did, you know, the Scottish Parliament did a lot to reduce, for example, rough sleeping and did a lot of good things. And that happened, let's say, with the 2003 Homelessness Etc. Scotland Act and lots of good things, abolish and priority need and so on and so forth. Then we get um, the austerity agenda. Now, that's a political choice from Westminster from 2010. We then get the series of welfare reforms. And what, what then ultimately, and also the fact that we count people as having the lowest employment ever, but the reality is if you do one hour a week, you're counted as employed. So, so what we've created is a system where there's insecurity for people to work, there's disincentives for people to work, and we have an increase in the demand in Glasgow, because Glasgow basically takes on all of the demand, the biggest demand in Scotland from all the surrounding local authority areas. So I think we need to, and, and I would say this obviously, been from there, but I think we need to. We need to that Glasgow needs to be given, you know, the ample uh, support and backing because we're basically carrying the biggest burden. Can, can I ask just one little one then, and then I'll move back on. in? Of course you are, but I know Eva Deary had a comment to make in relation right. to your question. Sorry, just to um, supplement that about who's sort of commissioning hotels and mm. unsuitable type of accommodation. Um, Mr. Jones is obviously speaking from a Glasgow perspective and most of our experience comes from an Edinburgh perspective mm -hmm. and our belief is that the reason that these unsuitable accommodations are procured by, by the council is because there's a massive pressure on the system and it's, as, it's not really through choice and we know through you know, Edinburgh Council setting up their homeless task force that there is a real desire to be reducing this type of unsuit unsuitable accommodation but it's just because of the pressure they're under um, so what's key here is preventing homelessness from happening in the first place, relieving mm -hmm pressure on temporary accommodation and that's where social security comes into this and it's absolutely crucial okay my, my, my last wee question is you said earlier about devolving everything to scotland now one of the things we know is that what's devolved so far um is quite steady in its economic management um what you're asking for is a completely different scenario particularly in terms of economic shock so have you given any consideration to that what do you think the impact would be? Because obviously on transfer, the, the block grant is adjusted accordingly, but then the economic shock would sit with the Scottish Parliament. Well, I think the reason that, that, that Governor Law Centre came to the conclusion that, that, that the universal credit, um, uh, and, and I would be all for actually all social security being devolved to, to Scotland, uh, is, is because it's been, universal credit was a good idea. Mm -hmm. 
the, the, the problem is in the execution and delivery. And, you know, I know from colleagues uh, in London uh, who are knowledgeable about these matters that it would have been easily for the universal credit system to have been designed to be seamless so that people could have just been imported into it, you know, electronically, automatically, because DWP has all that information. Yet the system that we've created with universal credit, you know, with not, you know, uh, res resulting in people being paid in arrears, um, the way it's quantified, so it's not, you know, so if you get two wage slips, ultimately you end up having an overpayment. Um, the fact you can have up to 40% deducted from universal credit and be pushed way below the breadline. All I'm saying is that I genuinely believe that the system's been designed as part of the hostile environment. It's the same hostile environment that the UK government's created for asylum seekers. And what they've done with welfare reform is they've created, uh, and I guess if, if you want to be kind to the UK government, um, you could say that it's been created as an incentive because they believe that people need to be given a you know, carrot and a stick and there's the stick to get you back into work. But what I would say is that it's completely flawed and that's why the only way that we can sort it out for Scotland is for universal credit to come to this parliament. But the question around yeah. economic shock, which was my question. Well, so, well, but when you say economic shock, do you mean because th there would have to be additional monies? Because there's a volatility in it in a way that there isn't in the current devolved benefits. Well, well, in, I mean, if, if you think about it, there's a lot of, if looking at it from a cost, like, so let's say a cost neutral position, mm -hmm. you could you could redesign universal credit so that, that it wasn't such an ordeal to apply, apply for it and it wasn't calculated in the same way. What I'm saying to you is that the way that we create social security in terms of how one applies, because we know that the decision makers get things wrong very, very frequently. But it's simpler than the legacy one for application. I, well, I, but I, th I think it's created more problems than, than, than what we've had in the past. I think what we've done is we've walked one step forward with universal credit and several steps back. And uh, other witnesses, and we, we move on. As much as I might like this this mission drift line of travel, um, <laughs> as an SNP member, I'm convener of this committee, and and, and a mission drift uh, it is. If the committee wishes to do an inquiry into the devolution of all social security benefits to this place, <laughs> the, as Michelle Ballantyne seems to be suggesting, <laughs> uh, I would embrace that, but it wouldn't be for my. For, 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 for my decision to make is, is convener. Are there any additional comments uh, from our other witnesses before we move on to Alistair Allen? OK, thank you, uh, Alistair Allen. Thank you, convener. Um, I'll try to stay on mission. Uh, I was going to ask in that case about the issue of rent arrears and mm. something that's been a theme in many of the um, sessions that we've had in here about universal credit has been potential links between changes to the benefit system, specifically around universal credit, and what the picture is in terms of rent arrears, both from the point of view of tenants and landlords. So I just wondered if you had any observations about that. <coughs> Sorry, thank you. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, I know that you're going to be hearing evidence from Citizens Advice later, and they've got some really strong evidence on this, mm. which outlines how rent arrears have changed since the introduction of universal credit. But it is absolutely our experience that universal credit has led to the creation of greater rent arrears for tenants. The five-week wait um, automatically puts tenants, both private rent sector and social rent sector, of course, um, into arrears. And what from our experience is that it's very difficult for tenants to then get out of these arrears and particularly for tenants in the private rented sector. The private rented sector charges rent in advance as normal and the benefit system has um, charged or gives the money um, in arrears so there's that gap um, and it's, it's just extremely difficult and it, it puts tenants in the PRS particularly in a, in a very precarious um, situation. What, we, what would be interesting, perhaps, for the committee to look into is uh, where private rented sector tenants have gone into arrears, which have resulted in eviction. Um, there is a, new, a ground or a mandatory ground for eviction in the new PRT, which means that if a private rented tenant is in arrears of a month's worth for three consecutive months, that's a, um, a mandatory ground for eviction. Um, but with the way universal credit is designed, it's very likely that PRS tenants are always going to be in arrears and will always be at risk and kind of at, at the mercy of their landlord not to pursue eviction. Yeah, I would, I would completely agree um, uh, with, with all that's been said. I think when this parliament was looking at the Private House in Tennessee Scotland bill, as it was then, 
we weren't particularly focused on universal credit and the fact that that ground that's in the 2016 Act, um, as has been noted, is just all you have to have is one month uh, rent arrears over three consecutive months. And because universal credit, and we've certainly got case study examples from Government Law Centre, where there has been much longer the delays, way, way longer than five, uh, five weeks, people are, are, are going to be pushed into that. Now, the Scottish Government obviously has done uh, good things in terms of Scots choices. So, you know, there's been powers that have been used so that people can opt for the rent to be paid directly to the private landlord. But even then, there's examples where there's still delays because the system has become much more bureaucratic uh, and uh, uh, it's, not in the, it's not in the control, as it, I suppose it used to be, in terms of local government. So, so all of that results in, in, in a greater propensity towards eviction. And ultimately, the first-tier tribunal has got a fairly low bar to, you know, to overcome to decide that actually they have to grant a, a decree. So I think we need to revise that aspect of the 2016 Act uh, unless we're able to fix universal credit. Uh, yeah, just to come in on that, I guess, um, in terms of that five-week wait, you know, we can see absolutely no logic in it, and it does serve really to put tenants, in particular in the private rented sector, into debt, um, how you're able to manage without money for that amount of time, um, whether you were, be, you know, if you went that amount of time without a wage, then that would it, you'd be incredibly difficult for anyone, so I don't know how it's supposed to be that you're meant to manage on that. Um, and there's all this talk about, you know, run-ons of housing benefit. Yeah, that's fine if you're transferring over from housing benefit. But if you're a new, if you're a new claimant, you know, if you're brand new to the social security system, you've not got a claim before, then you don't get that run-on. You've got at least five weeks, five weeks, if not longer. And yes, you can get an advance, but you've got to repay that. And that is going to be through deductions to future payments. So you're always going to be in the system of precarity. And we do feel that, you know, that system has been set up to put tenants into debt, to transfer debt to tenants. And that's not just about, you know, doesn't, that debt doesn't just affect, you know, us through the possibility of eviction, per se, but also about how we experience homes. You know, you can't heat them properly. Um, you can't escape from them because you've got no disposable income to go and do anything else. Um, you might be afraid of losing them. You can never really call it your own. So it's a much wider social question as well, and one that we think is really serious. Um, you know, and it's against the grain of what social security should be. Okay, thank you. Yeah. You've anticipated my next question, which was whether you, you felt the system uh, of advances worked, and I was keen to hear whether others uh, on the panel had views about that as well. Obviously, we've anecdotally heard much the same evidence as you have about how the, the system of advance uh, advances don't work for the reasons you've given, but I just was curious to find if there's any evidence around that. Unfortunately, our is anecdotal as well, um, but I, the DWP should be able to provide evidence on how often advance payments are provided and how often they're taken up um, to give more sort of um, substantial evidence to it. But our um, experience is that advance payments, there's quite low awareness of them. Um, we know that job coaches don't have that long with individuals when they're making a claim to explain um, advance payments, how to access them. And, and the sort of process around it, we find people who do access advance payments that are extremely worried about paying them back. Uh, I think Mr. Daly referred to them being paid back at 40%. I think it's been reduced to 30%, but that's still an extremely high percentage of somebody's other income, which is often quite low. So that is... Um, quite a lot for, for a person to take on. And lastly, we find where people are accessing advanced payments is because they have other priority debts that they want to pay as well that are they're bringing on with them um, so that they will prioritise them too. So if they access an advance payment, uh, and this is anecdotal from uh, landlords as well, that the landlords may not necessarily see um, the rent they're due that month because the tenant has other debts to pay and have used the advance payment to do that. Comments on that, Alistair? Finally, Convener, um, you mentioned earlier on the CEB and their proposals. We'll be hearing from the CEB later on, but I just wondered how you felt that would work, as they are, given what they propose as an alternative system, whether you had any views on, on how that might work, uh, the idea of, of, uh, of assistance without it being repayable. We would certainly support it. Um, as I said before, we cannot find any logic in have, making tenants wait mm. five weeks, at least if not longer, due to other administrative delays. Um, and whether it transpires that maybe a, you know, your your entitlement might change, whatever after that. But 
we just feel it is completely against the grain of what social security should be. And if you know the Scottish government does have the power to introduce something like that, which I believe that it does through top up powers, um, we would certainly support the idea of a non refundable assessment payment. I, I, I mean, Governor Law Centre certainly uh, would, would say that that is a very sensible idea because if you were to do a cost benefit analysis, although it, 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 you know, it's, if it's a one off payment, it's going to result in somebody not, for example, being taken to the first tier tribunal for eviction. And if you think about the cost to the public in somebody ultimately being made homeless, which ultimately, I mean, there's, there's empirical evidence that shows it can be anything from 20 to 30,000 pounds in terms of the different services that people have to access on, in terms of homelessness. It would make sense as a prevention to, to have that. But I think, I think the ultimate solution, as I say, on a, I mean, the, the point about it being sustainable is, I mean, in some respects, um, what that solution is doing is putting a sticky plaster on a gaping wound. And presumably on that... Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Can I just say really quickly that yes, we would support that proposal and um, we would see it as an investment in, in a person. It would um, avoid hardship at the pass um, and it would support both the tenant and the landlord as well and it would give the landlord some certainty um, in sort of keeping this tenant on and, and continuing to rent them. Uh, we commissioned um, research into no DSS recently which showed that landlords private landlords are increasingly quite worried by uh, universal credit and did cite the administration and particularly the initial five-week wait yeah. as a particular concern for them. So this would give um, landlords a bit of peace of mind as well, I think. And finally, you, you mentioned, uh, Ms McKeever, about the idea of the Scottish Government uh, essentially mitigating this, this situation, mm. presumably without putting words in anyone's mouth, however, it would be simpler if the situation were not uh, created by the UK Government in the first place. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, um, sorry, Mr. Allen. Just, just for my own clarity, and I suppose for the OR, for those who who, who did such things, you, you, you're effectively talking about if the DWP won't facilitate payments within two weeks, then rather than trying to seek an advance from the DWP, the Scottish government or some other body should step in and provide that money as a one-off grant to support. Is that, well, is I was making the point that presumably it would be better if the UK government hadn't created that problem in the first place. Oh no, absolutely. Oh, yeah. But 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 the the, the, the the campaign call was yeah. that yeah. someone should step in, be it the yeah. Scottish government or any other organisation, to give that as a grant. But the underlying issue is if you could pay job seekers allowance within two weeks from application, if you could pay income support from two weeks of application, then you can just pay it from two weeks of application. So why don't you just do that? Mm -hmm. Is that effectively the position? Of the witnesses. Yeah, I mean, if you think of, if you think about it, I mean, effectively, that could, I guess that could be done under a discretionary housing payment. Um, and just very quickly, the, the, the difficulty with discretionary housing payments is that we're currently using it, and this is maybe coming to your point, convener, which is that we're currently using it to offset the bedroom tax. Well, let's not forget about the the monster of the bedroom tax, which 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 the Scottish government's now spending 50 million per annum having to offset, and that's a 52 week DHP application. But for any other discretionary housing payment, it's usually 13 weeks that you know the payment runs for. Um, so it's, it's, it's just important to bear in mind. Um, yes, I think, I think the use of that power would, I believe, be more cost efficient because it would, it would, it would contribute to prevention of homelessness. Okay. Um, Mark Griffin, do you want to take us forward next line of questioning? Yep, thanks, Queen. I wanted to talk about um, direct payments to landlords. Um, I just ask, first of all, how you feel um, the DWP's alternate payment arrangements and Scottish Choices are, are working just broadly. I'm mean, the only person making eye contact with me, Mr. Bailey, <laughs> so go for it. Yeah, I was only looking up convener. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I, I, I mean, clearly, there's, there's, I have to say, I always, I always like to compliment Spice um, for their excellent work. The, the analysis that Spice has done in terms of its house and social security. Uh, so, so in terms of the actual data that's there, what I think is interesting is the relatively low take up of you know alternative payment arrangements and um, the Scottish Government, Scottish Choices. Um, so, so, so whether this is an issue of uh, a lack of awareness uh, or, or, uh, or, or other reasons, um, I'm, I'm not sure. But I mean, what I would say is that 
Government Law Centre was absolutely delighted that it was possible for the Scottish Government to introduce Scottish choices because we were not that long ago sitting in a position where we were terrified you know, that people were going to not be able to have their rent paid directly to the landlord under the kind of limited circumstances of being able to demonstrate you were vulnerable. So, so, we, so we very much welcome the position that we have in Scotland, but I think the, what I'm saying is the official analysis in terms of the take-up numbers, I think gives me a little bit of cause for, for worry. Yeah, um, just to say, I mean, I, we would certainly, of course, support the opportunity to give tenants a choice if they want to have their rent paid directly to their landlord because that would help them for whatever reason, then we would absolutely support that. But of course we do view it as a, you know, as a sticking plaster, particularly because you can't get your Scottish choice until the second assessment uh, period anyway. So you're already um, in difficulty at the beginning, potentially. However, I'm not sure that it is like necessarily um, useful to compare that to an, app, uh, an alternative payment arrangement, simply because from what I understand, Alternative payment arrangements um, can't, you know, they're not granted on the long term, they're reviewed. You have to prove a certain level of need for them, a certain vulnerability and give evidence that you need to have it. So, and they can also be reviewed at any point um, by, the, by your work coach, by DWP. So I'm not sure that they're necessarily useful to compare to one another. Um, I think ideally what we'd want to see is in the way that an APA can be introduced immediately, we'd want a Scottish choice to be introduced immediately and that to be a choice, you know, not that you have to prove that you're vulnerable in some way. You should be able to get a choice. Aoife, do you think? Um, I just want to flag, um, I agree with everything that has been said, uh, especially around um, alternative payments can only really be instated from the second assessment period. Um, Otherwise, in terms of administrative problems from conversations with um, social landlords, if a person has an alternative payment in, in place, um, there is an alternative payment schedule, so they get paid, the landlord gets paid at a different point, and just administratively it's quite confusing for landlords to sort of separate out this payment because they get it in a big chunk, especially if they've got different tenants or a number of tenants getting APAs. Um, so I think that maybe just needs sort of untangled a wee bit. And I think it's been kind of touched on, so you can have Scottish Choice or an alternative payment arrangement. Um, the uptake of Scottish Choice so far is quite low. I think it's about 38% of people took it up who were offered it in the last year. Um, but it's that could be for a number of reasons, that low uptake. They may already have an APA in place. They may not be aware of it. Um, so I think it's quite early days for Scottish Choices, and I think maybe that could be looked at a wee bit more just to sort of disentangle how people are accessing it and what they're getting from it. OK. I mean, we heard about that last week, about the issue with Scottish Choices only being available for the second um, payment. Is that something all witnesses agree with, that it would be beneficial for Scottish Choices to be implemented from the first payment? Yes, yes. definitely. Okay. And if I can come on to my um, second point, and perhaps this um, would address the, the low uptake issues, just to whether uh, witnesses feel that um, direct payments to landlords should be the default position, with tenants then having a choice to, to opt out, um, with, with that option then covering anyone with, with a vulnerability at the, at the outset? I, 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 I think Govan Law Centre would certainly support that. Uh, I know that Ailey's talked about the choice, and, and, and choice is something that's is often very lacking in the private rent sector because people don't have a choice uh, you know, in terms of what they can access. So, so I'm, I'm certainly very uh, empathetic and sympathetic to, to, to given choice. But having a default position, if you think about behavioural psychology, you know, when somebody has to, if somebody's kind of, you know, coping with different things in their life and they actually have to go and do something um, when they've got other things that are troubling them, then that, they, they might not access, you know, they might not do that. Whereas if you make it a default that they get Scottish choices, then from a behavioural kind of psychology perspective, um, that would be a good thing to prevent rent arrears from happening, but still retaining the choice. Uh, if, if a tenant um, wanted to choose. Ely McIver? Um, we don't really have a strong view on whether it should be default or not. Um, we think it's positive that it has a choice. The reason that we, that we don't have a particularly strong view on it is that even if it were paid directly to the landlord, it doesn't fix the problem that you have to wait five weeks for money. So 
it's yes it would certainly be beneficial and there would definitely be tenants who would benefit from that for a range of reasons but I guess the reason that we don't have a particularly strong view that it should be a default is that it doesn't fix that initial problem. Just that I would entirely echo what Elias just said. So, Matt, do you want to just follow up on any of that? Yep. No, I've no follow up on right. direct payments. Or, no, I do have a separate yeah, line of question, if, if that's okay. Of course. Um, I wanted to come on to discretionary housing payments as well. And last week we heard evidence from Edinburgh City Council who um, set up a position that they would um, cover people affected by um, local housing, allowing shortfalls or um, people affected by the benefit cap for um, up to 12 months as long as people had demonstrated that um, they had exhausted all other options and that seemed to me um, through my experience in Central Scotland to be more generous mm -hmm. than what was on offer anywhere else. What are witnesses' views on how discretionary housing payments are, are operating across the country? Is it, is it as generous as 12 months has been, seems to be offered in, in Edinburgh? Fadiri? Um, from our experience, um, if you're not claiming um, DHPs for the reason of bedroom tax or a benefit cap, it, it's quite difficult um, to get your application um, processed or, or awarded, sorry for the... Um, awarded more so, um, just because it's our experience that by through the welfare reform, um, the welfare reforms that uh, DHPs have to mitigate, um, it's just taken up most of the pot. Um, I was interested to actually hear that Edinburgh are um, sort of committing to uh, dealing with LHA shortfall because that's just not our experience. And we also have um, problems um, getting applications in for people um, who are affected by the benefit cap as well and their awards getting sort of tapered off as, and that leading to homelessness too. So um, definitely it's our experience that it's not the case in brand otherwise that um, people who are facing LHA shortfall that their needs are being met by DHP. I, I, I mean, it's, it strikes me then, that it's very interesting, uh, uh, Mr Griffin, that Edinburgh have made that pledge because I do think it's a very progressive and, and, uh, and generous. Um, and it, it also comes back to the convenience point, which is that clearly then Edinburgh must have the data in terms of what that costs. Which, was, which kind of would be very helpful in the journey of looking at the, moving the 30th percentile to the 50th percentile as a sort of Scotland-wide concept. Our experience in Glasgow is that for non-bedroom tax, DHP, it, it, it's a process that you have to repeat. You know, so it's, a, it's generally 13 weeks that it's, um, uh, it's applied for in Glasgow. And I do think it's a very strained budget. Um, you know, because let's remember that DHP was designed to cover a wide range of, of, of possibilities where people get into difficulties um, and indeed in the social rented sector uh, as well. So, you know, it's, it's a budget that, that it, it, if you said the solution to the local housing allowance is for every one of the 32 councils in Scotland to use their DHP budget to, um, to offset it, I just don't think that that would work in terms of the ability for, for, for all local authorities to do that. Um, just to kind of echo that, I guess it's certainly very it's it's great that Edinburgh City Council um, are able to to give up to twelve months um, to address that shortfall in rent, um, and it's really good to know that now that we could we could direct tenants to that. But just to echo what Mike said from what we've heard from our colleagues in our Glasgow branch, you know the the amount of time that you can get a DHP for tends to be much shorter than that and that's actually the first that I've heard um, about the, the Edinburgh rate, certainly none of the tenants that we've supported um, that have got DHPs um, for that particular purpose have ever said that they've got it on that long term but that might just be because it's something new. Okay. Just now local authorities are relying on um, guidance from the DWP on administrating their um, DHP uh, budget Scottish Government now has power through the Social Security Scotland Act to issue guidance. Do you think that's something that the Scottish Government should look to do um, fairly soon to iron out some of those anomalies across all local authorities? I, I would say that would make sense to do that, but I think it's still going to bring us back to the problem uh, which, which this Parliament uh, discusses uh, on a frequent basis, which is not every local authority being in a position you know, to have the, the funds 
to do that. And if you look at a council like Glasgow, um, you know, we've got about half a billion pounds to sort out in terms of the equal pay deal for, for, for women workers. Um, so I just think, yes, the guidance would be helpful, but whether it materialises into action consistently across Scotland, I have to say, I don't think it would, but I would certainly welcome the guidance from the Scottish Government. Aoife Deere? Um, I would also suggest that um, DHBs could be reviewed more in their fullness. Um, I think DHBs, discretionary local authorities, have the ability quite rightly so, to operate them in, in varying ways depending on their local context. But the fact that every local authority has to fully mitigate bedroom tax, which of course we completely support, I would just raise the question of whether DHP is the best mechanism to be doing this or whether it would be more useful for DHP to be moved out, or sorry, bedroom tax to be moved out of the DHP system um, so DHP could kind of deal with the problems it was meant to deal with in the first place. But I also echo the point that while guidance would be useful, I think it's a, it's a question of resources as well. Uh, just to echo that, yeah, it does seem like guidance would be useful, but whether, how that would span out in practice, I'm not sure. Thank you, Camille. Can I just check with Aoife Deere, when you said about um, bedroom tax being moved out of DHP budgets, is that effectively way of saying however much that costs would still stay within DHP budgets and that money would then be spent elsewhere? So I'm just, was, it, was it actually a, a, a call for additional funds? Not necessarily additional funds, but really to look at it and to understand whether bedroom tax is best dealt with by DHP right. or whether there's another <coughs> method to sort of stop the bedroom tax at, at source or um, whether, just to sort of review the options around it. All right, okay, just, that, that's helpful. Michelle Ballantyne, do you want to come in I on that? I just wanted to pick up on that slightly. Um, can you clarify for me then your understanding of the way in which DHP is administered? Because in reality, when, when you talk about mitigating bedroom tax, in reality, DHP is a means-tested um, award. So it, it's not about necessarily directly mitigating bedroom tax. It's about actually saying, do you need the money? What's your circumstances? And we award it. So when you say take it out and deal with it elsewhere, are you saying there are, there are people in need f for one reason and people in need for another reason? They should be looked at differently because surely it's the same thing in reality when you're talking about a means-tested need. So my issue with bedroom tax being dealt with under DHP is that it's no longer a discretionary choice of the local authority to give it for that reason. We believe that bedroom tax should absolutely um, be dealt with and people should not have to, to deal with that themselves, um, but it, it's no longer discretionary. I think... Um, but it still means-tested. Most local authorities, you apply and you have to submit your income and expenditure and you get the money if the need is there. Mm -hmm. So what, it is, is that, that's why I'm asking yeah. for clarification. No, no, I, think that's really help, I, think, I think it's really helpful, Michelle yeah. Ballantyne, but just, I'm just wondering, if someone was to qualify to have their bedroom tax mitigated, the gap between the means-tested award that's already been applied and the gap to the rent, has means-testing not already been applied mm. before you then use DHP to, to mitigate the bedroom tax. Yeah. Uh, that would be really helpful clarity. Aoife, Deary, I don't know if you want to... I see what you're kind of saying, but I think it's slightly separate to the point I was okay. making. Could I come yeah. back to you on that yeah. question? Would that be well, okay? yeah, because I, th I think the issue here is, is, are you suggesting that everybody who, who has um, bedroom tax applied should get the money regardless of need because my understanding is that at the moment it's done through a means tested basis on DHB and if you separate it out how would you manage that so that's, uh, that's uh, mm -hmm. these um, you can speak for yourself Miss Deary but I think you were making a very separate point which you might just want to say again so it's not lost during this th this exchange just articulate again the reason why you would like the bedroom tax funds not to sit within DHP then I think Mr Dealer might want to make an additional comment yeah, yeah um, well, I'd definitely like to come back to you on that yeah, that's point, fine. but um, yeah. just to mm -hmm. reiterate what you've asked me to reiterate, um, is that it could be an option to look at um, because it's not discretionary for, because of the commitment that the Scottish Government has made, local authorities have to mitigate the bedroom tax and therefore it's no longer a discretionary <coughs> choice, so maybe there is a better mechanism um, by which that could be, uh, by, pe by which people could be helped. 
if they're affected by the bedroom tax. Does that... You know, no, it, yeah, I, I understand the point you're making. Fine. Mm-hmm. Do you want to add anything in relation to the means-tested aspect before I bring in other witnesses? No, I'll come back to you on that. All right, that's okay. fine. Okay. Thanks, Ethan. Mr Daly, did you want to come in? Just very briefly, Convener, just to say that I, I think we've ended up with bedroom tax uh, coming out of DHP for a kind of historical reason, which is that housing benefits reserved. So when the bedroom tax was introduced some years ago, that was the route for the Scottish Government to offset it by the 50 million. The money originally came from and obviously we now have the Scotland Act 2016 and uh, we've, we've got additional powers. But my understanding is that DHP, to be eligible to apply for DHP, you have to be receiving housing benefit or universal uh, credit housing costs. Yes. So I think the convener is absolutely correct uh, mm-hmm. on that point. Uh, and actually, I've never, we've never really thought about whether it might be neater, you know, to kind of now call it the bedroom tax, whatever. But in some respects, I suppose, at the end of the day, it's, if it comes down to the money cost of it, it you know, it doesn't, it doesn't change anything from, from the pot that's there. The pot, the pot is there, and whether you start calling things different names, I'm not quite sure changes the fact that one just has a pot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Ian McIver, do you want to add anything no. to that? Okay. A very patient Jeremy Balfour, we got to you, sir. My middle name, Convener. Um, good morning, panel. I've got two lines of questions. Um, the first one's going back to uh, Alistair Allen's comments about rent arrears. Some of the evidence we took last week, particularly from Edinburgh City Council, was that under the old housing benefit system, people had built up arrears under that system as well. And those obviously then transferred into when they transfer onto universal credit. And I'm just trying to work out, when we're talking about arrears, how much of that is historical arrears and how much of that is new arrears of the people that you're dealing with? So obviously, people don't just get rid of those arrears because they transfer across, they, they transfer with them. And obviously, housing benefit, no system is perfect, but had arrears within as well. So it's just to tag out, at this early stage of when universal credit is just starting to roll across Scotland, how much of the um, arrears are historical rather than new? I mean, I think certainly in, in Governor Lawson's experience, uh, historical arrears in the private rented sector uh, are, are, are much more short-lived, if I can put it that way, than say, for example, in the social rented sector where you've got a much more sympathetic landlord. I mean, often the landlord has got the wherewithal to allow very small payments of £3 a week to arrears, and cases in the sheriff court sit there for years, assisted, frozen, for that to happen. Now, I accept that in the private rental sector, if you've got somebody who's renting a property and it's, they've got a buy-to-let mortgage and it's one property, they can't do that. There's just no way that they can do that because they can't pay the mortgage. So, so I think the reality is that the pressure that's on the private rental sector that, that we're familiar with is so it's much tougher. Um, so we're not we're not uh, you know we're not laying that at the door of, of 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 private landlords. It's just that the economics is completely different, which is why I'm saying that the um, historical arrears aren't historical for very long because you get evicted. So the system then is very not that different within the private. That if I was on housing benefit and didn't pay my rent within the private, I would be evicted. And the same is true, really, with universal credit as well. If I don't pay my rent, the land... So there's not, there's not a difference in regard to the, the policy. Or, or, as you say, you know, if, yeah. you, if, if, if you've got a mortgage to pay, you've got to pay that mortgage. Yeah. So within the private sector, there's not much difference then between the two systems, because if you don't pay your rent, the landlord is likely to evict you. Well, that, that, that's absolutely correct, Mr Balfour, other than the point which my colleagues have, have, have made, uh, which is that the problem is that matters are exacerbated in terms of the universal credit, in terms of the administration and the delays and all the problems that we've talked about. And given that, that when, you could, when you look at what we did with the 2016 uh, Private House in the Tennessee Scotland Act, the eviction ground. So unless you, and don't get me wrong, you will. Ha- I mean, we've got experiences of private landlords who are very sympathetic and will mm. not just jump with one month's rent over three consecutive months to eviction. Um, they've maybe known their tenant for a long time and so on and so forth. But then we've got other examples where the landlord's under pressure and they can't sit around waiting for, you know. So, so universal credit is just from the administration of it, 
that is that is what's exacerbating the the position in terms of more likelihood of eviction and and homelessness. Yeah, just to say, um, I don't have concrete data on this, but I would imagine that in terms of historical and new areas, it's probably a bit of both. You know, let's not argue, let's not ignore the fact that rents in the private sector are extortionate. So it's not an unlikely situation where people might face that gap previously under housing benefit that they would have built up in years as well. But I would echo what Mike Daly has said, you know, um, that situation is compounded whether people have brought those arrears over and into universal credit or whether they've de you know they've developed them as a result of universal credit but the, the fact is you know you've got to wait for that money so that is already going to put you into a precarious situation that might compound um, previous arrears um, or it might be brand new arrears for you it could be either and i don't think we've got you know sort of data to can, say can, otherwise can I just clarify this? I, I, and i apologize if i, I i'm missing my point here but my understanding and I, and please do correct me, but if I go in on my day to do my universal credit and I need money on that day, I will get that money given to me if I can show that I need that money. Now, I, ha I appreciate that then I have to pay that back over a 12 month period, <coughs> but y you're talking about this, you go in and you've got this five week delay until you get any money. But my understanding is, and if it's not working in practice, I've been trying to know why it's not working in practice, is that if I go in and make that claim, but I don't have to wait that five week period, but I get the a loan, if you want to use that word, but I get the loan to pay that. I, I, is that not the situation? Yeah, certainly. And some people will take advantage and some people won't for whatever reasons. Um, and that's obviously up to the, the tenant to decide. But so I the think tenant doesn't have to go into rent arrears on universal credit if he or she takes that payment on that day? I suppose technically not, no. Um, so, oh, no, 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 but hang on. Yeah, I don't know, but Mr Balfour, you've got to allow the witness yeah. an opportunity. No, 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 but I think, I think we just got to clarify, that but, is but, correct. But Mr Balfour, you've yeah. asked three different questions and Ailey McIver's not had an opportunity to answer any of them. So could you maybe let the witness answer the question and then you come back for that clarification? I was just, um, I guess, to add that as a technical system, it seems to be designed with... A cre with you know that, that that could easily put a tenant into arrears. I guess that's what I'm trying to say, especially because the deductions that the tenant has to um, bear to their future payments are much higher under universal credit. And I appreciate that that's going to go down from 40% of the standard allowance to 30% in October of this year. But if we compare that to what the deduction levels were um, under housing benefit, I think it was 5% or something like that. So mm -hmm. it's quite a big difference. And that situation is ultimately going to put um, tenants in hardship. So to go back to the question, I do think that you know there's probably a case where there's a bit of both. There'll be some that will have historical areas, some that will have new, and some that might be, have a bit of a combination and might be compounded by the fact or not that they've decided to take an advance and have had to repay that. Of course, you follow up on that now, Mr Balfour. Yeah, I mean, I do, I do think it's important when we're talking about this is a tenant, this is an individual choice that they're making. I think I think that's the point. I was, you're saying it's a theatrical, well, it, it, it's an individual thing. It's a bit like, do I choose to choose, put the money to the... Uh, landlord directly or do I choose to take it directly? These are, are choices inbuilt in the system that an individual makes or doesn't make. I mean, I, I would say, Mr Balfour, that um, often the choice that's been created through universal credit is ephemeral uh, uh, because, because we need to remember that the people that, that Ailey's talking about very often, in my experience, are not in the private rented sector through choice. Maybe been evicted from the social rented sector, relationship breakdown, whatever. They can't get into the social rented sector, so they're not there by choice. And the only looking at the, Alison Johnson's point about you know, Lothian's five percent access to the market. So all you can get, you won't get the nice. I mean, so to give a quick example. I could spend six hundred and fifty pounds a month and get an absolutely luxury flat in the West End of Glasgow. But if I'm in receipt of universal credit uh, and, and benefits, I ain't going to get that. Right? Even though that's unlawful to be, for me to be discriminated against, but I'm not going to get it. What I'm going to get is a grotty uh, two-bedroom flat for that. So, so the choice is ephemeral. And I think what the UK government's done, and this all goes back to Ian Duncan Smith, I have to say, was this idea that you give, you put all that responsibility onto the claimant and that that was a wonderful, beautiful thing. Um, and all I'm saying is that in the reality of the, of, of, of the clients that I work with is that if you're absolutely struggling and you've ended up in a relationship breakdown, you're in the private rental sector trying to cope with a, a children, 
um, th having all that extra responsibility in a system isn't actually a, a, a helpful thing. I think that's a, quite a reasonable debate the committee will have to wrestle with in relation to yep. choices yep. and yep. what the balance is in relation yep. to... I've got a second issue. Can I'm happy going to... Yeah, okay. Yes, yep. okay. Apologies. You had to wait a long time, so I apologise. I'm asking you to ask this briefly. Sorry okay. about that. Yeah, I mean, I think this is probably a bit more where we can have a bit of consensus, hopefully. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, one of the things that has concerned me about the new system, <coughs> and I understand has been raised by Scottish Government and the DWP are now reviewing it as of this year, as, uh, yeah, January this year, is around the mandate for vulnerable um, individuals that you're dealing with. My understanding is, and perhaps you could just clarify this for me, is that you have to go every two weeks back to the individual for them to sign the mandate again, which obviously does seem to be slightly illogical. Firstly, is that mm. the case? And if it is the case, is it your position that the mandate should be for a much longer period than a, a two-week period? I think this, I think Mr Balfour, you're referring to, the, to an issue that, that, from the DWP's perspective, has been caught up in data protection, you know, GDPR, the 2018 Data Protection Act. Um, because the way that they store some of these uh, data, they have a lot of perhaps medical uh, information. And so the D, I mean, not that I'm paid to defend the DWP, but I mean, to be fair to the Go DWP, <laughs> um, they would say, well, we've got obligations to make sure that if we're given access to a third party <coughs> to access your data, we need to make sure <coughs> that you've consented to that. So that, I can see where the D DWP come from, but I would certainly agree with you that 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 has resulted, I think, in an overly bureaucratic system, you know, because because there's there's ways to get consent in a streamlined, easier fashion, and not having to comp comp renew, as you've said. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a fixable thing that the DWP can do, uh, without using the shield of data protection, uh, which is often used by so many people, you know, to kind of mm -hmm. to, to, to to you know to to, to thwart um, uh, engaging with a third party. Yeah. Marlott's went, Aoife Deere and then Ailey McIver. Yeah. Uh, just really briefly, um, Mr Daly has summed it up really well, but um, the only concern we would have with that, obviously there's quite rightly data protection, there's some quite sensitive information going on there, but where we'd be concerned and where we have experiences where this um, difficulty in getting this consent has led to delays mm. and issues yeah. with the person's claim yeah. and therefore putting them in, into a bit of difficulty. Okay. McIver. Um, yeah, just to add to that, it could delay the process, but could also cause like additional um, distress to the claimant as well, particularly if they are a vulnerable person and for you know a, a wide range of reasons. And yeah. that's a situation that we all want to avoid. Okay, two members want to ask supplementaries on this. I'm going to take both of them uh, before we go back to the witnesses for for a response because of time constraints. Uh, if it's on if it's on this issue, deputy convener, then Michelle no, it's Ballantyne. Not on this issue, not so completely separate issue. Right. Okay. It's on this issue. Yeah. Can you just confirm then that your understanding is that the client can put a note on their journal giving you permission, they can give you permission on the phone there and then or in person. So I'm, based on that, those three options, um, which are all pretty simple if you're there or if you're not there, can you just explain what the bureaucratic difficulty is in actually, in actually getting that permission and, and being able to talk to the DWP? Situation as Michelle Ballantyne would outline it, Ailey McIver. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, from what I understand, um, I think it's the sort of specificity of the information that you have to um, give. So the claimant would have to explain what exactly they want to, the, the information exactly that has to be disclosed, for what purposes. Um, and it's issue specific, so each issue that you need to have dealt with, for example, needs a certain, a, a separate uh, line of explicit consent, if you like. And okay. um, you also have to give details of the person who you want to disclose it to. You know, the branch they work in, all the, you know, all these kinds of things. So yes, in theory, it might be easy enough for somebody like you or I to add something to a journal and say, I want to give this person. Um, my permission to receive this part of information. But I think particularly if an issue is complex, if it comprises lots of different arms and legs, which quite often issues do, they start growing arms and legs once you start opening them up, um, that can be very difficult and time constraints for the claimant and also quite distressing for them as well, particularly um, if they are struggling for whatever reason to access their online journal, if it's difficult for them to make phone calls um, for any reason, or you know even you know, going to the job centre to give that, that permission, if you've got to do that every time, that's that's quite a big ask of somebody. 
Okay. Did you want to add anything? No, I mean, it, it, it was just the, um, the point, which is that, I mean, and I think this has been given in evidence, and I'm looking at the analysis of the written evidence that has been submitted to the mm -hmm. committee on this, is that the, mm -hmm. the overall picture is that communication with the DWP on, on these issues is poor. So, so, again, it's one of these kind of operational realities is that what we've done is we've created, as Mr Balfour says, a system that actually impedes what's in the interests of the landlords and what's in the interests of the claimant. And, mm -hmm. and that is something that I think is easily fixable for the DWP to get its systems sorted. Before we next line of question, Aoife did you want to add anything? No, thank you. Okay, Deputy Convener. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I'm interested in the question of how single people might be affected by social security and housing. Um, I've always suspected that single males in particular might be a, a high profile group. Um, it, just any information you could offer the committee uh, on, on that would be really useful. Anyone want to look, look at that, Ailey McIver? Um, well, just to come back on, I suppose, the gendered aspect of that. Um, women are disproportionately, single women are disproportionately represented in the private rented sector. And also because of the gender pay gap, the problem of the gap between LHA rates and actual rents is compounded for women. Um, on a sort of related point, um, we have experience of working with um, separated parents um, who are single <coughs> by themselves, um, who have shared custody of children. But if it's a single male, for example, who's under 35, he only gets the shared room rate. Um, he, if he isn't receiving the child benefit, um, he isn't the recipient of child benefit, um, he will only get shared room rate despite the fact that he will probably have obligations and, and want to have children around for overnight visits. So this we know of this particularly in temporary accommodation. Um, can, you know, single men, we've talked about this before, can't really access temporary furnished flats or in B&B and hostels most of the time which without a visiting policy but when they do have a flat by themselves they can only access the, the shared room rate um, which makes it difficult for them to procure the space needed to facilitate children visiting. Okay, it, it, Mr Daly, I feel it's saying to you only add something if you feel you really need to but I suspect I know the answer to that. No, no, I, I, I'm very happy with what my colleagues have contributed. All right, it's only because of time to straight to Deputy Convener, do you want to follow up on any of that? Um, no, I think that's an interesting answer. I, I think it, I acknowledge that there is a there's a gender dimension depending on the issue which affects women, but I, I suspect there's much deeper issues as well affecting single men. And I think it's interesting what you said there about separated parents mm -hmm. and, a, and a, perhaps an issue for another day. I presume the courts might take a view on access to children if that accommodation is not suitable mm. for children. Thank you very much. Okay, actually, thank you for raising that, um, Pauline, because I've certainly constituents of cases where there are certainly issues in accessing suitably sized or affordable accommodation for uh, fathers who want to have that positive relationship with, with ex-partner and, and the children, unless they enter illegal a co-parenting arrangement, that's not always reflected and that's not always the wishes of, of them. So that's a really important point to raise. Time is upon us. There were two other themes I know we wanted to discuss, so I'm just going to put it on the record. Perhaps you could uh, drop the committee a note in relation to some thoughts, or perhaps the next panel could could pick up on this. But there were certainly issues around how we better use the social security system to promote the private lend renting sector to 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 take on more responsibilities in partnership with them, the good providers in the private rented sector. Mm. So a better long term use of the social security system, because one of the pri things the private rented sector says is they're up for it if they get that long-term commitment and secure financial support. That would be really interesting to know. And I know Michelle Balton and I have previously discussed the idea of tenancy deposit schemes at a local authority area. Certainly my experience in Glasgow is they can do some quite good work. I think it's why people that operates it in Glasgow, but actually the funds they have at their disposal actually discounts the vast yeah. majority of private rented accommodation so it's actually who would fund tenancy deposit mm. schemes can we think more imaginatively about how the social security system could work to fund some of that 
be that the local authorities, the Scottish Government, or indeed the UK Government. So just thinking innovatively about what more we could do, and we certainly had an interest in tenancy deposit schemes and relating to the, the private rented sector. I hope that reflects some of the discussions we were having, uh, Michelle, before before the meeting started. Just wanted to get that on the record. Thank you, uh, all three of our witnesses uh, this morning. Uh, please follow the inquiry. If there's any additional information above that, again, you want, you want to send us, please don't hesitate to get in contact. And we will suspend briefly until we get our next panel in place. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Welcome back, everyone. We're still on agenda item two, Social Security Support for Housing, and we now welcome our, our second panel, who are John Rafferty, Visiting Support Group Head, Bethany Christian Trust, Gary Neal, Operation Manager, Rock Trust, and Rob Gowans, Policy Officer of Citizens Advice Scotland. Thank you to three of you uh, for uh, supporting our work in relation to this inquiry, and thank you. I think you sat through a substantial amount, I think, of that first evidence session as well, so we, we really appreciate that. We will uh, move straight to questions, and for... I said at the start of the meeting, declare an interest, but I am a director of Bethany Christian Trust, just for the record. I think you have just done that. So right, thank my you apologies for not doing earlier. Putting that on the record. OK, we'll move straight to, well, almost straight to questions. Uh, Alistair Allen, MSP. Thank you. Um, I'd be interested to hear your perspective on a, an issue I raised with the last panel, and I'm sure you, you heard the discussion about it, which is what you're noticing as organisations in terms of changes to the pattern of, of rent arrears. Um, it's in terms of uh, in terms of rent arrears, um, we've um, it's been an area that we've been sort of closely looking at over the over the past um, the past year. As um, um, since 2012, um, whilst debt issues as a whole have, have decreased, in particular consumer debt, um, rent arrears have increased um, as an, an area of advice by about by about 40 percent. Um, so it's um, um, it's something that we've, we've particularly looked into the um, the causes of um, the particular the particular reasons for that would be a, a benefits related issue, a loss of income, or um, unexpected costs. But it quite closely correlates with um, the um, uh, the, sort of the the introduction of welfare reform in 2012-13, um, and um, in in the last eighteen months, um, 
in relation to, to universal credit. Um, so it's something that's, um, that's a, a sort of particular, particular concern in terms of um, people being able to um, firstly get out of debt because um, um, most often people will either um, will either borrow from family or friends or from um, or from um, or um, from credit cards and that's um, that's not a sustainable solution or they'll they'll cut down on essential living costs of um, cut down on food and and um, and heating which um, um, which isn't a, a long term solution a long term solution either but it's it's um, it's certainly been something that over the um, the past six or seven years has been a has been a, one of our fastest growing issues in CAP. Um, I think it would say that we're definitely seeing an increase in rent arrears, um, defaultings on rent, and it's down to the fact that people are having to make choices on what they're spending their money on. And that might be, as, as has already been said, they're cho choosing between heating, lighting, rent, um, food, all these things. Um, the poverty gap is increasing year on year. Um, and the people who are on benefits are falling more and more closer into that poverty. Um, so they're having to make these systemic choices. Um, and unfortunately, in some cases, it is defaulting on their rents. Um, so we are seeing a, an increase in rent arrears. Yeah, and maybe Rob, we could maybe um, just kind of clarify a bit. But certainly, we, we don't, Rock Trust work with young people uh, and just the, the nature of our client group. We haven't encountered an awful lot of rent arrears, but certainly I know that one of the young men that we support through a rent deposit scheme, and I think this is perhaps something to do with the kind of universal credit and the difficulties in claiming house and benefit or help towards house and costs. Historically, we worked with a young man who worked in construction, so was essentially self-employed. And it, it, we only became aware sort of, a few weeks or perhaps months down the line that he had been off ill and he hadn't had any income and had fallen into arrears. And there wasn't really any benefit or any, he wasn't able to access any help at all to pay off his historical arrears. So. Um, that, that seems a new thing for me. I, I understand that in the old sort of legacy benefits and housing benefit, there was an opportunity to go back and make a historical claim. And mm -hmm. is that correct, Rob? Um, I think probably not. Um, I'd need to sort of double check on the the, the particular case. I mean, in terms of um, in terms of uh, for for historic arrears, it's. Um, Lee, um, seen people with um, with debts of, of, sort of thousands and thousands of pounds. Um, if they're not sort of currently um, sort of in in receipt of a benefit, that can be that can be difficult to um, to pay off. Um, as was sort of alluded to in the in the first panel, then um, there's um, it's possible for landlords to apply to have that deducted from a benefits benefits claim but that can um just be at a, a sort of very high rate sort of currently up to up to sort of um 40 for for all sorts of um all sorts of debts um so that that can that can sort of present present difficulties in, in terms of um in terms of clearing clearing rent arrears well, Mr. i think you there, there's a point of clarity where the committee needs more generally so thank you for putting it on mm -hmm. the record and we'll check that out ourselves so that, that's really helpful uh, I'll allow you continue well, some of that question. One of the things that you'll have seen that the committee is interested in is, is whether there's any connection between some of the, the difficult choices that you're describing that people have to make around food and heating um, and situations to do with delay in initial payments uh, of certain benefits. Mm -hmm. And I suppose that gets to the heart of the, the matter that we're one of the one of the matters we're interested in as a as a committee you'll have heard describing you'll be more than familiar mm -hmm. from your own work. The situations that people have to face if if the mm -hmm. uh, if benefits are paid in arrears and so on, and the implications mm -hmm. of that for 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 uh, housing costs. So I just wonder, mm -hmm. can you say anything about either anecdotally or in terms of evidence about what you've seen as an impact on your own work as a result of these these changes? Mr. Rafferty, don't don't be shy, gentlemen. Just <laughs> make it clear you want to speak um, for it, Mr. Rafferty. I think, on Bethany, we we deliver housing first. Um, services here in Edinburgh, uh, and it's one area that we're seeing um, a dramatic rise in, in sort of arrears and stuff like that. Um, 
we are working with the most complex needs, the most chaotic lifestyles, um, and these people having to interact with the benefit system as it is universal credit is very problematic. Um, and it causes delays in receipts of benefits, it causes delays in receipts of housing costs. So yes, we are seeing increased um, demand on, on services, on support, um, and it, there is an increase in the delays that, that uh, costs are being paid to landlords. Um, and obviously, the, as we've already talked about in the first panel, the direct payments only being made from the second assessment period onwards is exacerbating that. Um, and that people who have the extreme chaotic lifestyles that, that we are dealing with receiving the first receipt of benefit um, and they are then choosing what to do with that benefit and they were, they're choosing to, the choice is they pay their rent, they may pay off drug, de drug debt that they've already got, um, so the choice is who am I paying my rent to, am I going to pay my rent to a landlord who may, may evict me but that's further down the road mm -hmm. or am I paying, paying off my dealer who could break my arm or whatever in the immediate days. So that's the kind of causes and, and cases that we're dealing with right now. Um, and that's the stark choices that people are making. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's costly to their, their health at the moment. Any other comments, witnesses? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> certainly uh, the length of wait and time for first payments to come through. Um, if people haven't taken the option to get an advance payment, uh, we're seeing young people who will come with us regularly uh, to access food banks, they'll come to us to get free toiletries, um, they'll come to us to get some advice on where else they can go to get free services that otherwise they would be expected to pay for. It's certainly increased um, since the introduction of universal credit, it's, it's, there's no doubt in that. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess in terms of my housing kind of take on things as well, I think what we're also seeing is that um, people accessing the social welfare fund more often when they're in, in kind of in desperation, can to access crisis grants is beginning to have a, a noticeable impact on the awards that the young people that we're supporting are having when they're moving on to their own accommodation in terms of the awards that they're receiving towards furnishing their accommodation. I suspect that that's, um, that's linked. Going to that? Um, I think it's sort of, a, sort of a, very, uh, a very similar picture of people who, um, who um, will be um, sort of going without to, to pay the rent or to um, or to to manage their arrears, um, um, whether that's um, not putting the the heating on, whether that's um, whether that's uh, sort of going going without food, or or um, if they have kids, making sure that the kids are fed, but but cutting down themselves. Um, this um, is in. Um, um, and sort of uh, possession action from from landlords and um, um, and uh, the threat of um, the threat of eviction um, and uh, sort of people people needing support from from uh, um, from advice services, but um, but also from the the Scottish Welfare Fund and and, and food banks. Finally, you mentioned it there again. It came up in the last panel, but the the system of of advances. Is there a high level of awareness amongst the people you're dealing with, the service users, uh, indeed the people who, who might benefit from this, of the existence of an, a system of advances and does it work, even if they access it? There is an awareness because the people we are working with have the support to, to make the claims, so our, our staff are aware of the, the advances. But what people are choosing, they have the choice of, they can have a, an immediate hit of five weeks or they can have a, a hit of 12 months uh, of um, reduced their, uh, benefits. And we, we, what we are saying is that people are choosing to, to take that initial five-week hit mm. um, rather than sustaining a year's worth of, of taking uh, reduced benefits. Um, so that's, that's what we're seeing. Any other comments on that? Yeah, I mean, young people can be <laughs> quite impulsive and they, they, sometimes their decision-making, given just because they're young people, um, can be flawed in terms of the way we might see it. Um, 
young people's brains are still developing and th there's, there's a wealth of evidence to suggest that when people are in poverty and people are in financial difficulties, there's actually physiological changes that take place in the brain that, that affects their decision making. Uh, and so we do see a problem that it can seem quite um, appealing to get money in advance um, and that that's not often the best thing for people. Um, obviously we will encourage young people to make a choice that they believe is right for them but um, we do see it as potentially an issue and uh, these advance payments have to be repaid from benefits that are actually already keeping people in the bed line, red line when they're paid in full um, and 30% to come off your uh, benefit payments is that is going to leave a young person going without heating or going without electricity in their home or going without food. They definitely have to make difficult choices if they're going to be making repayments. Thank you. Okay. Can I just check, because I, I know time will be tight here, but I think the last time we were discussing this, it moved, or it developed into a conversation around uh, d direct payments to, to to landlords and alternative payments versus um, Scottish choices. And, and, and the crux of the debate kind of seem, seem, seem to be around choice and whether the, and I think Mr Griffin, I apologise for, I'll let, let you in at this, this point to develop this further, it was about um, whether or not the choice should be to opt out of that payment going direct to the landlord or opt into it, and whether that's an, the opt out on balance would be desirable because whilst not everyone needs that level of protection and not everyone is vulnerable, it's difficult to identify who can be vulnerable to that. <coughs> direct to landlord and opting out might might be beneficial. Just to get some of that on the record, and I think Mr Griffin will want, will want to explore that a bit further. I'm just conscious we've got time constraints today. I want to get all the evidence on the record th this morning. Mr Rafferty? I think from from my, my point of view, from Bethany's point of view, we would um, we would agree that, that the default of opting out would be the, the preferred manner for us. Um, we talk about choice and we're still giving people choice. Um, so the choice to opt out for us would be the, the preferred manner. Mr Neil. I would agree entirely with what John's just said, yeah. Okay, and I know it all feels a bit rushed, but Mr. Mr. Gowans? Yeah, I mean, I think we um, we would um, um, we would still favour um, the the Scottish choice is being given given as a choice of whether to have direct direct payments to landlords or whether to have paid to the to themselves. Um, the um, the alternative payment arrangements um, should, if 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 they work correctly. Um, Catch people in in situations where um, where they have addictions or um, debt and and would um, where that I guess the the sort of the choice is is taken away. Um, I think probably it's um, there still needs to be done about um, promoting promoting awareness of of the Sc Scottish choice and what they mean in practice, um, and and also to sort out some of the some of the issues in terms of. How those payments are made to the landlords, um, um, but we would um, we would um, uh, we would support um, the people being given a given a choice of um, of whether they they receive the housing payment or whether their landlord does directly. Opt in or opt out, though. I think that's what we're we're, we're really asking as a committee. Um, the, so it's ba basically the the choice rather than it's it's um, that's a default either way. So, so, so right, right now it's it, it's opting mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. So you only get Scottish choices yep. if you opt into it, mm -hmm. and the money goes direct to you yep. by default. So mm -hmm. there is a default currently mm -hmm. with an opt-in. The alternative system could be the default is the money mm -hmm. goes straight to the landlord, and you have the choice mm -hmm. to opt out. So would it be the status quo or would it be opt out? That's what we're keen to know yeah. as a committee. Um, it would be the status quo for us. Okay, thank you. And I do apologise, Mr. Griffin, has been exploring this line of questioning. Do you want to just? take us forward on that? Yep, just briefly, Kevin, I think that's been mm -hmm. helpful to hear that. The only issue I would mm -hmm. go back um, to that I raised with the previous mm -hmm. panel is just whether you think um, on Scottish choices that the work should be undertaken to make sure um, a payment can be made direct to landlords from the first payment um, rather than the case um, at the moment where it's only the second payment that can be paid direct to the landlord. Definitely, um, yeah, I would agree that that would be a, a great strive forward um, to have the direct payments to the landlord from the first assessment period. 
Um, what we're seeing right now is that, as I've already said, because it's from the second assessment period onwards, people are making choices, poor choices, um, as to where they're spending their money, um, and paying their rent is not always the, the first choice or the first option for them. So definitely changing to the direct payment from the first assessment period would be an op a preferred option for us. So Neil? Yeah, I would agree, definitely, the direct payment from the first payment. I think um, it would certainly make it a little bit easier for, for homeless people to get into the private rented sector, which is already a, a, a very real challenge, um, even taking the, the, the payments out of the equation. There's many barriers that they need to overcome to get into the private rented sector, so that would certainly be one thing that could be done quite easily to help. Mr Gowans? Yeah, that would that would be a it would be a helpful thing to have. I think um, some of the um, the issues we see around, um, in particular around the first the first month's rent. Um, so um, so that that would be a, a helpful thing to have. Okay, thanks. Do you want to explore your other line of questioning you have yeah, at this point um, on discretionary housing payments? Um, just as I raised with the previous panel, just to ask for mm -hmm. your experience as to how the, the non bedroom tax element of um, discussion your housing payments, how that is operating, how that's supporting uh, people you've uh, come into contact or, or, or been representing? Um, I think for Bethany, the only, the only inter interaction we have with the, the DHP is when um, our tenants and our supported accommodations default through or are sanctioned on the, the universal credit and DHP kicks in at that point to pay their housing costs for the period that they're sanctioned, so that's the only interaction we have. Okay. Mr. Neil? Yeah, I mean, as I've said, Rock Trust operate a rent deposit scheme, and, and um, one thing uh, that strikes me that's maybe a, a bit unhelpful is that um, uh, discretionary housing payments are only available to people who are already in receipt of housing benefit, and a lot of the people who approach us for help to get into private rented accommodation are not already in receipt of any benefits necessarily, and um, that cuts off the option for, for help with a, with a rent deposit. Um, so if there was an opportunity for someone to access a discretionary housing payment uh, before they, they, they start to receive help with a housing cost, then that would be another great help in terms of helping homeless people enter the private rented sector. Yeah. Rob um, I think on the on the on the whole, the discretionary housing payment scheme works well, though um, though it, it can vary area to area, and and um, what um, in terms of what's what's prioritised in which area, how long the awards are made for, um, and sort of how much is how much is sort of spent throughout throughout the year. Um, there's um, instance we've um, we hear from. Um, uh, Sort of CAB advisors that in some areas the um, the local authority is very um, sort of um, very willing to um, to help with um, issues to do with the local housing allowance such as we've we've heard about um, on the um, from the first panel. Whereas in others it can be very difficult to get um, get those those payments. Um, again, sort of um, um, people receiving for instance for the um, in relation to the benefit, um, the benefit cap, or or universal credit issues outside of um, outside of the um, the bedroom tax can can vary across the country. Um, so we, we would we would support um, the, uh, the the guidance being um, being reviewed, and in particular around um, around what's what's prioritised and what areas are. are, are, are um, should be prioritised for for sort of discretionary payments and long term payments, um, and indeed the areas that um, um, that are almost sort of not discretionary as Shelter Scotland were talking about, such as the um, such as the bedroom tax. So I think it would be we would welcome a, a sort of review of the of the guidance. Okay, thanks, for that. Mr. Gowns. In particular, mm. um, we've heard um, anecdotal evidence of. The, the variance and generosity of different local authorities mm -hmm. um, DHP um, schemes. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you're able to provide 
um, written evidence to the, to the committee at, at a later date of just any hard data that you might have on basically the variability of uh, DHP schemes across the country. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Thank you. Okay. Alison Johnson, before by Jeremy Balfour. Um, thank you, convener. I'd just like to ask um, a couple of questions on the, the benefit cap and exemptions. People can be exempt from the benefit cap if they claim certain social security um, payments. Mm -hmm. um, and these include obviously several of the payments that are being devolved to this parliament. Mm -hmm. But these often have quite low rates of take up. Um, so people facing the benefit cap may well be entitled to an exemption, but mm -hmm. they may not know that they're entitled. So. Mm -hmm. You know, I appreciate that uh, that some of these benefits can be very complicated mm -hmm. to apply for. So, is there scope to help people escape from the cap by ensuring that uh, you know they have the assistance to help them apply for a payment that provides an exemption? Um, that would, um, I think that that would be um, that would be very helpful, and it's it's certainly something that. Um, uh, that, that CAB will um, was on as as obviously a huge part of our work is um, um, is helping people to find what what they're entitled to and and help to um, to claim it if they um, if they should be entitled to things. Um, some of the examples for the benefit cap are, are of disability benefits, but um, we think that um, that some of the the sort of the changes would would need to go would need to go further. Um, the benefit cap. We know that um, th the majority of people affected are um, lone parents with three or more children, so it can be very difficult for them to um, to move into work or move into different accommodation. Um, in fact, um, the the sort of work and pensions committee have recently done an inquiry on um, this, found that um, sort of 82% of the people affected by the benefit cap weren't expected to to look for work by the the social security system. So. The benefits they were claiming were um, things like um, sort of income support or um, or the equivalent within universal credit because they had um, uh, um, they had young children um, to take care of or um, or they weren't able to work due to um, due to ill health. Um, so um, we would um, urge everything to be done to um, people take up all the benefits they're entitled to, but we would also um, um, to see the um, the benefit cap um, reviewed because it, it takes into account a lot of people who um, um, who probably shouldn't be affected by it. Gary Neal or John Rafferty want to add anything to that? Um, nothing to add at this moment because it's, it's it's an area that we don't have a lot of interaction with. Also, don't feel you, everyone has to answer yeah, ev yeah, every yeah. question. Just 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 come in when you, when you wish. Um, Alison Johnson. Yeah, just really, you know, obviously there is more that we could be doing to raise awareness of benefits that people may be entitled to apply for. You know, they may be entitled to, we know every year that there are billions of pounds of unclaimed benefits. What do you think we as a parliament, the Scottish Government, could be doing to increase take up more generally? I think in terms of... Um, uh, it's, it's obviously sort of support for um, the kind of independent advice, um, independent advice sector. Um, the uh, the sort of the um, the Scottish government have um, have also um, set up their own schemes. One of which we're, we're sort of partnering on um, with them on the um, on financial health checks. Um, but um, I think sort of um, sort of going more widely, it. Um, um, I think sort of re re reducing stigma is is very important, and I think um, um, I think sort of some of the way the way in which we we talk about social security um, and moving to um, think where um, where it's 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 not seen as a as a sort of a shameful thing. Um, it's not seen as a, a sort of something that's that's sort of um, that's very complicated, and that um, and that. Um, and that the sort of generally awareness is raised that it's 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 not something that's all oh, that's just for um, for unemployed people or as grounders. It's something to um, to support um, to support people in a range of situations when they um, when they need it. Any other comments on that? I think with the 
reduction in local authority budgets. Um, a lot of local authorities are choosing to close down advice shops. So in West Lothian, we had an advice shop that um, people would go to, to to get the advice for maximising incomes and stuff like that. Um, that's now closed um, because of the, the cuts to, to their budgets. And I believe other local authorities are, are doing the same thing. So there's a limited choice of where people can go for advice. There are, there are advice um, services, City of Edinburgh Council deliver advice services, but there's a waiting list to get onto those services. So we are limiting the choice for people um, going forward to get the, the advice that they do need. Okay. Um, anything to add, Mr Neil? No, I'm not sure that'll have that's actually helpful. No, no that, that's fine. Thank you. Can I, Thank you. Can I just check before we move on? Because I was quite worried by the question, the, the, the position Mr Rafferty made in relation to advice services. I'm just wondering if it's a mixed picture across the country. Uh, so, for example, in, in Glasgow, uh, the local authority have got a, a network of advisors in libraries who are there more often than not advising on universal credit. I know Citizens Advice are, are doing quite a lot of advice. I'm just wondering if it's an inconsistent picture across the country in relation to the type of support that's available. And I'm not saying Glasgow's perfect by any means, it's just I'm, I happen to be aware of it, that's, that, that's all. Um, I'm not aware of the countrywide, I mean, I'm just aware of the areas that, that I have of responsibility in. So West Lothian is one of those areas. I know that the, the advice shop has closed um, and there will be advice facilities there. But again, there's a waiting list. There's only so many so many people yeah. working on those services. So there is a waiting list to get anywhere near those services. And it's absolutely an issue for West Lothian. We have to work out as a committee to if that's cons happening consistently across the country, otherwise that's very helpful. Jeremy Balfour. Uh, thank you, uh, and good morning, gentlemen. Um, really probably aimed at the Lock Trust and, and, and Bethany, I think one of the advantages that you organisations both play is the wraparound support you give to individuals who are very vulnerable. Um, I suppose, without going too far off being before the community pulls me back, um, obviously, we're looking at private tenancies particularly, but how do or is there a better way that the social security system could help you, not just with the kind of paying the rent, but the wraparound support to make sure that individual stays within the tenancy and is supported in the tenancy? And do you get support from the social security system for doing that? And if not, you know, what would help in regard to that kind of service that you provide? I would say that um, <clears throat> Bethany's evidence or experience would be that our work is all done in, as a, a social rented, a social um, landlord. Um, our accommodation is all supported, so our our wraparound support is provided by contracts from local authorities. Um, Social Security pays for the housing benefit aspect um, direct for the rent, but the wraparound support is provided by contracts from local authorities. What we are seeing um, throughout our services is that services are being blocked because of the lack of mainstream move-on options and the lack of affordability for our service users to move into the rented, the private rented sector um, because of the LHA and all the rest of it, the under 35s um, shared um, options and stuff like that. So what we are seeing is that we are working with people, people are staying in temporary supported accommodation for a lot longer than they were doing um, because there's no suitable move on options for them. So, can I just, just before you answer that, Guy, would it then be helpful for you to be able to give that same support within the private rented? Yes. And would that be done through contracts with councils? Yes. Okay. okay. I think that is actually a really helpful line of questioning. Um, and it's that idea about, I mean, you mentioned Housing First, Mr. Rafferty, yeah. as well. The idea, if you look at the, the investment that be it the UK social security system, the Scottish social security system, local authorities and others put into some of the most vulnerable and complex individuals that need our support over a 5, 10, 15 year period, 
it's a significant amount of money and it's whether or not there's a better way of investing that money and I know that's what Housing First is all about and it's whether or not the social security system could support that more intensively in a speedier way because actually the it might benefit the public person in the medium term to do that as well as meeting uh, the, the, the core needs of, of people who, who deserve our support. So I think any comments in relation to what layers of the social security system you think could do more and how they could do that, I think would be really helpful to the yeah. committee. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Happy, um, yeah, I mean, certainly, and, and I'm speaking about young people here uh, and uh, the, the shared room allowance uh, and, the, and the local housing allowance, um, we come across many young people who are in temporary accommodation, who are homeless, and that will mainly be bed and breakfast accommodation. I met a young man this week who had been in bed and breakfast accommodation for three years. Um, um, that is unusual, I will say, but um, there are many young people in temporary accommodation uh, who will be receiving vast sums of money in house and benefit, uh, who could very easily uh, afford to, and, and manage to live in a private rented flat if the local housing allowance wasn't capped at £68 a week. Um, but it is. Um, and six to eight pound a week will not go anywhere close to, to covering the rent on a even a shared room. Shared rooms in Edinburgh are, are our research would suggest they're between sort of four hundred and even up to five hundred pounds for a shared room in Edinburgh, um, which is out with the means of most of the young people who approach us for support to get away from temporary accommodation. They're quite happy with the idea of having a private rented flat. Uh, I think historically, what we found was a lot of young people that we worked with were willing to just hold out until they could get social housing. I think that's much less the case now. People are open to the idea of being in the private rented sector, but it's just closed off for, for most young people, and it's closed off for all young people if they're reliant on benefits to, to cover their housing costs. Anyone else wants to comment on that? Um, yeah, I think um, we'd, um, we'd agree with those those points. It's um, There's... Um, there's it's, it's obviously um, if someone doesn't have anywhere to move on to that's that's affordable, um, then that's not that's not a good a good outcome. Um, I think the social security system can can do more of that. Firstly, by um, doing that if somebody's in in sort of temporary accommodation that's provided by the private um, the private sector, that's that's also covered in in full by social security support, but. Um, Sort of as um, as was mentioned on the on the first panel, um, um, we would um, we would support the the ending of the the sort of freeze on on sort of local housing allowance um, and have it restored back to its um, its value so that that it can sort of take into account the the sort of the um, housing market. I think there's also um, mentioning that um, um, that there can be a, an issue of um, um, what you'll see is no DSS adverts, um, so that there's um, um, a sort of a large number of um, private rented sector properties are um, are ex um, exclude um, um, claimants of, of housing benefit or, or universal credit. Um, that um, um, so that there's uh, there seems to be a, a sort of a, a sort of number of reasons for for that. Um, but um, it's it's something that, that that basically can take out all the um, all the sort of the affordable private rents out of out of the market, um, and um, it's it would appear to be um, to be discriminatory against um, against people who receive receive social security support. So um, so we would um, we would look to um, see some action taken on that. Okay, that's helpful. You've actually saved us time because I saw some nodding heads from Mr. Neil and Mr. Rafferty. So there's a line of questioning we don't have to ask, so it's really helpful. Uh, Pauline McNeil. Thank you very much. It was actually on the last point that mm -hmm. Tim Rob made in relation to mm -hmm. the willingness of mm -hmm. landlords to take DHS claimants. Mm -hmm. um, what I'd like to ask you have you seen evidence that that uh, is increasing? In recent times, um, it, it seemed to be um, seemed to be anecdotal, but um, 
it seems that, that an increasing number of landlords are um, are sort of reluctant or refusing to um, to rent to to tenants who are in receipt of, of universal credit, um, partly because um, um, partly because they um, they've potentially heard about some of the some of the issues and are concerned about uh, are concerned about about rents. Um, I think there was um, some research that um, that the um, the Social Security Advisory Committee um, um, undertook last year, um, which found that um, on the on the shared accommodation rate, um, there was um, they searched through all the um, the flat listings in in Edinburgh and in Glasgow, and in particular in Edinburgh, they found I think there were um, out of about five hundred or um, 570 lets there are there are only four that would be affordable um, and all of those um, the the landlords um, wouldn't let to um, uh, to people who received housing benefit or universal credit so in effect there were no um, there were no options for um, for people in the in the private rented sector that they would be able to afford on the shared accommodation rate you see in your submission that um, we should legislate to prevent that from mm -hmm. happening. Um, so you see that the Scottish Government should consider options, including mm -hmm. legislation, to prevent mm -hmm. landlords from excluding recipients of benefits and advertising mm -hmm. lets. Do you want to speak to that? Yeah, I think there's, um, there, is, there is a range of, of options that, um, that, could, be, um, that could, be, could be taken, um, whether that's um, in terms of to, um, to help in some way um, incentivise um, um, landlords to um, to be able to um, to take on um, people who are um, who receive universal credit or housing benefit. Um, that that's um, ultimately sort of um, uh, addressing some of the um, some of the issues with um, with universal credit around the um, around the housing payment that are causing um, causing delays in the housing payment. Um, uh, whether it's um, work with sort of landlords and mortgage lenders um, uh, to help uh, reassure them, or whether ultimately that it's something that um, they might want to go down the, the legislative route of, of sort of preventing um, preventing uh, sort of adverts that um, that uh, that discriminate against um, people in in housing benefit and, and social security uh, and receipt of social security. Um, because um, the um, um, with um, social social housing unable to um, to take everybody who would want a social housing place, um, the the, the, um, the sort of waiting lists across the country are around um, I think around one hundred and fifty eight thousand. So there's not enough social housing for everybody that wants it. Then there is a need for um, people to access the the private rented sector. Um, to, to get a home um, and sort of in those circumstances then um, be a, be a case for for sort of taking um, sort of taking action do the other witnesses have a different view no I, I'd agree, <coughs> I would agree with what Rob said I'm interested to the idea of incentivizing mm -hmm. <coughs> landlords we certainly come across a lot of landlords uh, and and their lending provide their their lend mortgage providers have actually stipulated that they can't take people on benefits and so um, you know, but e e even if you legislated for the kind of overt discrimination with the no DSS kind of things that, that, that have been going on for as long as anyone can remember, there's a lot of stuff that goes on that you probably couldn't legislate. I mean, certainly working with young people, we see it all the time. Young people are seen as a risk. Homeless people are seen as a risk. Um, so I, I'm, I'm interested in the idea of incentivising and maybe taking a lot of the risks away. Um, that would certainly be something to look at, I think. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and that is, I mean, the private rented sector, they're in, the, they're in that business to make money. Um, and homeless, vulnerable people are seen as a risk. So anything that we can do to mitigate against that risk can only help to bring people around the table who are then willing to, to rent out to, to vulnerable groups. So addressing the LHA, addressing the, the direct payments from assessment period one, these types of things, anything that was already been discussed can mit against, mitigate against the risk that landlords are going to take on. Thank you very much.
Yeah, yes. Michelle Balfour, of course. Yes. On that. Um, you use the expression seen as a risk, but Mr Neil, earlier on you, you expressed the fact that some of your tenants and, and people you work with, and I know from my own experience when I headed up the drug and alcohol unit, that a lot of my tenants were a risk. Um, and you made the comment they'd been evicted from social housing and then we're having difficulty finding private rented accommodation. So is there something actually between that that we actually need to do in terms of providing housing that is more supportive, that actually um, gives the kind of wraparound care that we've talked about with some of your organisations? Because certainly I found my tenants needed huge input to actually maintain a tenancy. Um, and I, I feel, you know, when we're looking at a lot of the people you're talking about, it is that vulnerability, it is that inability to cope quite often in the home on their own, um, and the often quite sometimes not because of themselves, but of the people that come in and take advantage of them as well. So, you know, is, is, have you got any comments around some of that? Because obviously maintaining tenancy seems to be the big difficulty for many of these people. Yeah, I mean, certainly <clears throat> there is all. There will always be a place for supported tenancies and, and outreach support. Um, and yeah, a lot of the tenants that we work with in our supported accommodation may have had failed tenancies in the past. Um, but f for every tenant that we meet uh, that, that has had those kind of issues and, and, and need to develop those skills, we meet probably two or three who would be able to live um, independently in a private rented tenancy. And, uh, we're often we'll have to uh, decline applications from young people who are homeless trying to access our support accommodation because they don't actually because they don't need the support that we offer along with accommodation they just need accommodation so I, I, I absolutely agree there's a real need for supported accommodation but there's also um, a very uh, significant number of ho the homeless population who could manage really quite fine and their own tenancy if, if that financial barrier was removed. Can I go on to ask some of the stuff I wanted to ask earlier about deposits then, because I think that fits neatly into this. I mean, one of, one of the big issues about getting into private rented accommodation is the initial outlays. Um, and we know from some of the evidence we've taken that it's not sometimes just having a month's deposit or being able to pay in advance. And, of course, we've got the ongoing problem that, that benefits not just UC, but benefits previously were all paid in arrears, which has always made it difficult for, for private tenancies. <coughs> but in terms of that scheme, we know that local authorities can give help with deposits. And I wondered if you could kind of tell us what your experience is sort of nationwide about people being able to access help with deposits, and also particularly around whether the levels of deposit are commensurate with the marketplace. Mr. Neil, did you want to? Yeah, well, um, Rock Trust operates a rent and deposit scheme, mm -hmm. uh, and we can offer a paper bond um, rather than an actual cash deposit. And there are enough landlords out there that are willing to work with us on that. Um, I think one of the main stumbling blocks that we're finding now that has been established for a couple of years is that the idea is that young people will gradually save towards. Uh, having that deposit which they can then lodge with the mm -hmm. landlord, young people are just finding it extremely difficult to actually save for mm -hmm. that deposit. And so we've got young people who've been working with us in excess of 12 months. And I think one young person out of 14 has actually saved for their full deposit. The rest are saving towards their deposit, but it's taken well in excess of 12 months. And so if someone could just pay that cash deposit, it would not only would it help them in that regard, it would also make landlords much more uh, willing to take people on if they had that cash deposit, because we we still encounter a lot of landlords who, who won't consider a paper bond. Um, yes. um, as a, a social landlord, we've just taken the decision to do away with um, deposits in our supported flats. Um, and we've done that with a view to offering our tenants as they come in the opportunity to put what a deposit they would have done for our flat into saving mm -hmm. for a, a, a flat further down the road. Mm -hmm. um, and we will work with our tenants to, to help them attain um, a deposit for when the time comes that they do achieve a suitable move-on option. Um, we haven't interacted with 
rent deposit schemes and, and all that sort of stuff, so it's, it's not an area I can talk into. But from a, an accommodation provider, we've taken that, dis that decision mm -hmm. to do away with the, the deposits that we would take and offer the opportunity for tenants to, to save up towards a, a, a deposit further down the line. Um, I don't have a, a, a sort of a great a great deal to that add to that um, see something um, in terms of um, thinking about the kind of the the, the social security side of it's um, potentially something that um, uh, sort of discretionary housing payments could be could be made for and I think have have been in some cases um, that's obviously a sort of budget with with lots of pressures and lots of priorities that we've we've heard about but um, um, sort of happy to, to kind of go away and have a have a look through our data to see see what might might be going on. Okay. Okay. Just re really, if you're finished, like, can I just take a supplementary on, on your points? Yeah. I'm really trying to keep it tight because I'm aware yeah. of your time. Yeah, yeah, I know we're, we're uh -huh. going to have to close the session yeah. soon, but, but mm -hmm. I think you've hit upon something quite crucial because there's mm -hmm. there's no loss of money to the landlord mm -hmm. because legislation says the money has to go exactly. to the tenancy deposit mm -hmm. scheme anyway. So effectively, mm -hmm. what we're talking about mm -hmm. is underwriting and going guarantor mm -hmm. should something go wrong in between the tenants moving in mm -hmm. and if some, some issue was to happen with, with the tenancies. Actually, the landlord wouldn't be out of pocket. It would be one of the three tenancy deposit schemes in Scotland. So you could reasonably, uh, given the fact that the Scottish Government controls this, you could provide six or nine months once you're in the tenancy to pay up your deposit mm -hmm. Into directly into the tenancy deposit scheme. Mm -hmm. So this I doesn't seem a solution that requires money. <laughs> it just requires a reorganisation of where mm -hmm. we are. Mm -hmm. Is is that something you think would be achievable, Mr. Neil? Well, it would certainly be an improvement on what we have just now. I mean, that's essentially what we're doing with our rent deposit scheme. I think if you opened that up to, to a wider homeless population, then absolutely that would be welcomed. Okay. Um, okay. I, I assume that's something other witnesses without yes. word of the mouth would, would be supportive of. And the time is almost upon us. Um, I'm, I'm conscious there's a number of matters we haven't raised just because of time. There's, there's opportunity for another question if a member wants it at this point. Okay. Other than that, can I just say you might want to write to us if you any specific comments you want to make regarding uh, the cost of temporary furnished accommodation? Because, again, a theme might just be that irrespective of who funds it, local authorities, Scottish government, UK government, there could be a lot of money trapped inside the system. And the idea that um, those most vulnerable and on benefits are taking um, some sometimes, not always, sometimes poor quality accommodation, but it's significantly expensive, much more expensive than the private rented sector, ironically, quite, quite frankly. And a lot of the working poor can't afford to take it and our sofa surfing is staying with families and friends. There seems to be a lot of money trapped inside the system, and how we could release some of that to to, to be more innovative would really welcome your, your thoughts on that as well. Not just now, unfortunately, because you have to go and think about it, but I think we would we would really welcome that. So um, are there any additional comments any of you would like to make before we close this evidence session? Well, thank you very much for, for coming along. If you have any other additional comments, not just the ones I raised, but anything at all, please do stay in, in contact with the committee. But thank you very much for uh, giving evidence this morning. Uh, we will move straight on to our next agenda item, which is agenda item three, benefit automation. Um, uh, and I've got a suggestion to make to members because of time constraints, and we do have a a matter that we have to discuss in, in private at agenda item four, um, that I would like to suggest that we put off um, what will be an in public discussion in relation to the letter we've received from Inverclyde Council in relation to, to issues they've had in relation to benefit automation and data sharing with DWP. Uh, I think it's a very important issue they've raised. We, we should give it a bit of, bit of time for discussion. So be minded yeah. that we put it on next week's agenda and we make it one of the first items we discuss on the agenda as opposed to one of the last items we discuss on the agenda so that we it doesn't it doesn't fall off then given time constraints. Would would uh, and my apologies to Inverclyde Council that we're delaying that slightly, but would people would members be agreeable to, to that approach? Yeah. 
Okay, thank you very much. We can now then move to agenda item four, uh, which is social security support for housing, which we've previously agreed to take in private, so we now move into private session.